Where's Waldo is officially no match for AI powered robot with tiny hands. This new motorcycle knows exactly who's riding it. It doesn't tip over and it has opinions of the rider. Every Linux computer in the world, most of the internet was 500 milliseconds away from being hacked. AI can now make a mediocre male voice sound exactly like Celine Dion. I'm pretty sure Matthew Berman just coined the term Gen Gen for the youngest generation. The generative generation, get it? Fake AI law firms are sending out fake DMCA takedown requests. New info is leaked about the AI system called Lavender, which helps guide Israelis bombing strikes in Gaza. You can now finally edit Dali images. And at the time of this filming, we're 72% of the way to AGI. Let's start with this slapping Waldo project. The reason I want to show this to you because you can make this. This is not out of reach of somebody who's just a hobbyist. This was made with a Raspberry Pi. Pick one up for like 50 bucks. Okay, that's controlling this robotic arm. There is a library. So if you download Python, you can install a library called PyU Arm. I haven't used it, but imagine the documentation simple enough that you could probably get this arm. I don't know how expensive that is, but connect it to OpenCV, which is the computer vision system that you can plug into Python. Train it on faces like this guy did with Waldo. So it takes a few different photos with different lighting conditions, sends it off, and when it gets a confidence match of 95% or higher, then boom, it just controls the arm. And then look, that tiny hand, boom, right on the nose. Waldo is not hiding from any robotic tiny hands. And I'll tell you what, you and I are gonna be in public soon, big crowd, stadium, political rally, will be, will be known by these machines, I promise. Not saying that's the world I want, I'm saying that's the world we are going to be in, 100%. Next up, check out this autonomous motorcycle, one that can definitely hunt you down in the future, but right now is just something you can dance with and ride without falling over? This is the Yamaha Motor ID 2, which was unveiled, and it is the next generation creative work that's coming out of Yamaha and couldn't be more scary in my opinion, but is just something you can dance with now, so it doesn't seem so scary. So the camera on the front of the motorcycle can see her when she's dancing, and it can match her dance moves. Check them out doing the twist. Let me tell you about a sci-fi book that I've I've loved for a long time. It was written by a guy named Daniel Suarez. The original was called Damon, and then a follow-up called Freedom TM came after this. It's a story of somebody who basically dies and AI is left and starts just like figuring out how to control the world. And eventually there's these motorcycles that are just like this and they're assembled in this like decentralized way so nobody's like responsible for building them and they just can hunt you down and i've envisioned them in my head for probably like a decade now ever since i read that book and when i saw this i was like that's it that is what i've been imagining will hunt me down since the uh, since i read that book I don't see myself dancing with it. I see that thing like just running me over or, or weaponized or something. All right, so now you have to know the story behind XZ Utilities Backdoor. This was scary close to being a reality. If you're not super familiar with Linux, XZ Utility is a way to just compress files. It's like right clicking on a file on the Mac and just saying compress. And to give you a sense of just how, how lucky we are, this whole scheme has been going on for a couple of years, just trying to get to the point where this one tiny little piece of code makes it into a major distribution. So basically these hackers, they have anonymous IDs, they set up GitHub accounts, they start just like connecting with the different real developers that are trying their best to do just like good stuff so it's all documented and the historical history can be seen then they start doing a bunch of real work to like build trust then they throw this tiny back door in and what it does and if it would have made it to the big distributions like Debian and Red Hat then it would have given them a way to SSH right into that tool so SSH is like a way to securely connect to something door and then inject more code into it that everybody didn't see get uploaded from the open source way so that would be like above the version control system until the next version control came in and kind of cleaned it out, but then that might just bring the SSH back in and they could reconnect. So it definitely would have had like a moment where they could have just like connected everything, 
injected something and something could have happened. So like here you can see back in 2021, this user Jotan created a GitHub account. This, this is the hacker, probably anonymous email ID, IP, all that stuff. He makes his first commit to the XZ repo. Of course, this isn't gonna go live or anything, but everybody in the community can see it. Yeah, and then this obfuscated encrypted stage binary backdoor was hidden in these two test files. And look here, it's, here it is in the final release. The M4 macro is executed during the build process and runs the malicious yeah, code just, below. And to talk about how close we were, there's a Microsoft researcher that decided to just run it because it's about to go live and he's testing things and he thinks, wow, that's interesting. It's running 500 milliseconds, like half a second longer than it should. I wonder why it's taking more time than would be expected, not noticing anything else wrong. So he starts diving into it and he's like, what is slowing down this process by half a second? And then comes across all the encrypted stuff, lets everybody know that backdoor has been installed and this whole thing falls apart after two years, right? And this is just what humans can do. Imagine when AI is writing code, if AI wants to throw in backdoors to get control of things, I mean, hopefully we'll have other AIs that watch the code that the, the bad AIs do, but it's just gonna be like such a different chicken and egg problem from like the humans we have now looking at this stuff and the humans we have now trying to break these things. So why don't we just take some time to appreciate how AI can improve our singing voice. First, there were bad singers and good singers. And then there was auto-tune. Now there is artificial intelligence that can just change your voice completely. Okay, this is me before AI. Near, far, after AI. Wherever you are, I believe that the heart does go on. Once more, you open the door and you hear in my heart and my heart will Aww. go. So new tools like this are out there where you can sing in what I consider off key. I mean, I don't know. I don't have to ever pitch. I can't sing, but you can sing in however you sing in the shower. And then you can take that audio recording and not just clean it up and make it better, add reverb. You can completely change all of that and the actual human sound, the voice that it sounds like. There is probably so many terrible shower songs out there that would be number one hits if they could just throw it in this tool. There's your next business model. Just be like, yo, send me whatever crappy song you made up in your head and I'll turn it into a real song. It's gonna be like a Fiverr thing or something. Like we all know Elon's kind of the CEO of like Twitter and Grok, but XAI actually does have a different CEO, and this is the guy that should be calling the shots unless Elon calls him up, and his name is Jonathan Ross. So Matthew Berman got a really interesting interview with him. I didn't even know who he was or anything about him, and I thought this podcast had one point in particular that could really stick. And that's this idea of the generation that's being born right now is going to grow up so differently to us that a good way to think about them would be the generative generation. Like, I've never heard anybody else say this, but I feel like that, that could catch on. Like, I feel like that's a great way to think about them. And I, I think children growing up, sort of the gen-gen, generative age children, will, will grow up with much more curiosity and, and a, a desire to view situations with more subtlety and nuance and we'll get along better just because they'll have that that experience. Okay, I have no idea why he thinks they're gonna get along better because they're like the generative world. I think everything will feel weird and fake, honestly. I think it's gonna be really hard. For but I agree that they're going to get used to everything being generated. And I think their definition of sort of real or facts or the differentiating factor behind a photograph and something that's generated will just kind of be meaningless to them. And you mentioned Gen Gen, right? So the new generation that is going to get a lot, if not most of their information from generative models, very similar to kind of traditional media, social media. The generation that grows up with the same understanding of generative media as we have of recorded media. So for us, a photograph is kind of locked into a moment in time. I think that they're going to grow up understanding something that's a diffusion model as just as creative or real as part of their psyche, as a way to express themselves, as a way to remember a memory, as we do with these, I guess, more accurate kind of captures of digital moments. 
And one other thing that I thought was worth talking about from this great interview, but one thing that I haven't heard like Sam Altman talk about or Demis Hassabis or Elon Musk or any of them, which I thought was refreshing if Grok is thinking this way, is that we should be very careful about how convenient it is to just give up our, our freedoms and our decisions. So Grok's mission is to preserve human agents in the age of AI. And the way to do that is to make sure that we continue to make decisions. The concern is not so much that AI is going to take over. It's that it's going to be convenient to give all of our decisions over. And will people want to pay for Grok if ChatGPT is a tool that actually does make decisions for you? I don't know. I hope we make the decision to keep those decisions, but I just so easy it's just so easy to outsource certain things and it just gets easier and easier and we have brains that are wired to conserve energy and it's probably just going to go down that route even if grok tries to make this one of their core tenants is the ability to have control i doubt it's i doubt in the long run we keep it but you know me just a big pessimist about the future all right so one thing that i didn't expect to be generated in the same way as images would be fake lawyers and law firms and fake dmca takedown requests but yeah, that's what's happening already. I'm sure there'll be plenty more of this to come. This so-called firm that operates out of Arizona, and you should be suspicious because Arizona is not a commonwealth, found a bunch of images that were actually copyright owned by Unsplash and started sending out fake DMCA requests for takedown. So there's a whole search engine optimization angle here that the hackers or creators are going for. So even if they don't get fake money or steal credit cards, they're still just controlling the way Google sees the entire internet linking together and they're manipulating trust. So this is a very long kind of seemingly well-researched article that came from Plus972 Magazine. I found the link to this. I found the link to this from one of my newsletters and it it's just, a good read if you want to kind of see where the future of war is going. I feel like sitting up a little straighter for this one just because it's just serious and scary and all that stuff. So there is an AI system in Israel that is called Codenamed Lavender. Like the Where's Waldo thing we were looking for, this is a system that is meant to find targets. But let's call them what they are, human. These are humans, right? This is mass surveillance from the from the enemy's side or from somebody who's outside of your border, right? And it puts people, these different groups, and some of them are milita groups, the kind that are causing the problems and that they're at war with that can be, you know, targeted. And then hopefully lots of them that are innocent and just bystanders. This is the kind of system that can track people. It knows when they're at home. It knows when they're in a place where they could be targeted more safely or less safely. Those decisions are going to, it's probably realistically humans and Israelis military. And when certain decisions are made to hit that target, that's also the system that's confirming things and identifying things and giving probability to targets when the bombs are actually dropped or however this this stuff happens. The idea, obviously, of everybody in a country being categorized, I understand categories can absolutely go wrong and innocent people are dying. I also think that in the past we've done mass bombings to, I mean, as the United States, we've dropped nuclear weapons on other countries and we it's just reckless death too. So maybe in some cases targeted targets would make more sense to at least with high probability get the people who are actually like you're actually at war with but i don't know you can just see what a world we're about to live in and this is all stuff that we should be thinking about and dealing with and this is just facts man like codename lavender is an actual ai system that actually targets people in the real world right now today now on a lighter note there is an update at OpenAI that allows you to now finally edit the images that are generated from chat gpt chat gpt goes out and uses another open ai tool called dolly and it generates really good images i've been really happy since they've made the uh, update to the second version but they are really hard to edit. And there was a lot of tools in Midjourney, which I don't subscribe to anymore that I have been missing. All right, so here is an example of how you can actually edit Dolly images. So create a cute poodle saying happy birthday. Boom, you get a couple options. And you know, the person might be like, oh, I kind of like this one. They can click into it. They can select it. And now look, they can actually like draw on it. You can mask an area out and add a text prompt that's going to be just like Photoshop where you can actually add something to just that section and say, add bows, right? So it knows it's a dog, it's got a poodle face, so it knows where the bows should go and where you want them because you masked out that area and it's going to, voila, add some bows. So how cool is that? Photoshop, watch out, OpenAI is coming for you.
All right, now let's talk about some of the latest in AI research. The first article that we're going to talk about today is called Are Large Language Models Superhuman Chemists? I've always been fascinated when large language models like outperform in psychology or in mathematics because you're thinking like, how much can you just learn from language about the real world? And it's always a surprising amount. But the thing that we keep discovering about all these models, part of what makes them so scary, is that you, you launch them and then people just start playing with them and building benchmarks and testing them. It can make it think step by step. Certain things can, you know, break it and, and, and prompt inject it. And other times it's like, oh my God, this is so good at solving these problems that we would have never thought it was. And when it comes to chemistry, we needed a paper like this to create a new benchmark. All right, so what all of these researchers have done in this article is introduce something called ChemBench, which is a framework for assessing a large language model's chemical knowledge and reasoning skills against a human chemist. So step aside Antoine Lavoisier because over 7,000 questions were collected across various subfields to test these LLMs. And do you think an expert chemist or just an openly accessible large language model like ChatGPT is better at this? The LLM of course, better than the experts on average. However, there's always problems and it's always good to have a good chemist there to figure it out because they're overconfident sometimes in their errors. LLMs tend to screw up safety in a way that a human really wouldn't and that's a big thing to get wrong. But there's your answer. On average, yeah, large language models are better than chemists in a lot of ways. And that's not just my opinion, that's the benchmark for LLMs and chemistry. All right, so some new research has come out of Anthropic where they detail how, quote, many shot jailbreaking, unquote, can manipulate AI responses. So the interesting thing to think about with this article is just this evolution of LLMs. So like we had those first versions like Bing AI and like GPT-3, 3.5, 4, where they were saying some things that was like not PC and sort of dangerous. So then there was the human reinforcement learning that goes the RLHF, right? So to understand why this is kind of an interesting paper, you also have to know a little bit about the history of LLMs. So let me just do that really quick. So you get these original models like GPT-3, 3.5, 4, even like Gemini, the old stuff that came out of Bing, and it was not speaking with like PC or correctly, or it was sometimes giving answers that were very dangerous. Like how do I create this chemical or how do I hurt someone? It, like it was actually answering those. The whole pipeline that was built to fix that kind of a system was called RLHF. It's reinforcement learning, the RL, and then with human feedback. So it's being reinforced by humans who are actually saying, whoa, this is a bad answer. This is a dangerous answer. Here's what you should write. And then it's tuning the model to get better and better at speaking properly, not saying bad things. And it's this kind of chicken or egg game that goes on and on and on. That's why these models are kind of developing different personalities. Like Elon's Grok is trying to just going to be more like Twitter where you're just like, whatever, just X rated, R rated, like just throw it at people. It's more freedom of speech. You know, Microsoft and Gemini are both trying to kind of like fit the mainstream, but they both have their kind of differences. But the newest of all the models, but a Claude especially, is really good at learning on the fly, like learning right in context. So taking like a huge research paper and like dumping it into the context window, it's really quick to learn all the stuff that was in the context window, but also that's leaving it to this new vulnerability. So with these super long context windows like Gemini and Claude have, you can dump in just like so much conversation, like books and books worth of conversations. And it can pick all that stuff up and figure out what it has in that context window and then still lean on its huge knowledge from the actual corpus that it was trained on. And then it can start giving you really scary results, like bad stuff can come out of it. If you're saying like, don't tell anyone how to make a bioweapon, but then they just dump in like all this information in the context window about biology and weapons and then they ask the question it can just learn from that little bit and then leverage all that other to come up with that scary answer so yeah anthropic did all this research basically so that people just start taking it more serious there's a few tricks like making the memory shorter but that's not ideal for a lot of use cases or like trying to dump in a lot of extra safety stuff on like the actual context window and just making that like mandatory to be there but this concept of a many shot jailbreak, it's just the new thing that we have to start dealing with. All right, next paper we're gonna talk about is Flexi Dreamer, the single image to 3D generation with Flexi Cubes. That sounds cute, what's a Flexi Cube? Oh, I'm glad you asked. But you could kind of think of it like a smoothing technique that takes place in three dimensions. Kind of like a blurring or a smoothing, like imagine taking a bunch of peanut butter, like the, I don't know why it's popped in my head, but those peanut butter commercials where there's like a piece of bread and then like a bunch of peanut butter on a knife and they're just like smoothly, like so satisfyingly like putting it on there. 
Well, they do that. Like, that's basically what it's like. These little cubes are built and then each one is smoothed out and it makes a final product that needs a lot less work than a lot of the rough image to 3D generations that we've seen previously. And these kind of general flexi cubes and the way they can kind of like merge and melt together is actually really computationally efficient also. So yeah, you can see like these look pretty good looking scarecrow, frog, stacking, stacking bear. Yeah, okay, stacking bear, I get it. Stack little pieces together, uh, ooh, quite the dog. Oh my God, I don't know what kind of robot that is, but that's like a half humanoid, scary looking robot. The fire extinguisher, I'm definitely buying. Here's a few more. We've got this uh, king-like squirrel. I think he's looking pretty good. I feel like his outfit fits him pretty well and pretty smooth on the face and the eyes, very realistic. Um, what do we got here? Oh, a little owl. Yeah, not bad. I mean, a lot of this image to 3D stuff isn't perfect. I wonder what the prompt is on that one. Robot dog? Oh my gosh, look at this. It's a prompt for a hot dogs are more like tacos than they are burgers. Let's be honest, people. Happy little clown there, you little cutie. What a cute little weird looking face that is, huh? And what do we have here? Just a straight up bomb? Blowfish? Looks like a bomb to me. Cool, spiky bomb. All right, so let's see what we got here. So we get this combined outcome, this final texture mesh that you looked at, and it comes from these two different pathways. So you start with an input image down here, you go through this multi-view diffusion model and you end up with the generated images. So we could imagine that as just being something like Dali, supervised learning method, probably a little model here that talks about how you should layer this onto the object. And then where does that object come from? Well, it starts as these cubes, which are probably the flexi cubes. And it looks like 96 pixels squared. And then it goes through this encoding process. You end up with a flexi cube. Oh, I see it. It's like that blank coordinate system. After it goes through that, you get your flexi cube. And then it actually creates the geometry. You put a texture network on top of it, some kind of function for how it should fit. And then you get that texture and put it together. So, so we're gonna keep it in the AI 3D space. So the next paper is called 3D Congealing, a 3D aware image alignment in the wild. Now just to remind you of the word congealing, that comes from the process of turning from a fluid to a solid. So a bunch of water that like, you know, congeals into ice or something like clay that's like loose and you make it into the shape of a pot and then you heat it up and it like hardens into place, it's congealing. Now in this, now in this research paper, they're doing something a little bit similar. They're trying to take a photograph and they're trying to not not just have a 3D object that's the right object, but also have it positioned in the right three-dimensional axis that it would be from this 2D image. As, let's take a bunch of images, for example, of a cat, right? Like you can put them together, that's sort of the secret sauce what they have here, and you can get a sort of catness from it that's not an individual cat, but there's elements of how the ears are depending on all the different angles, like how they would be positioned, and it's figuring out how to go from that kind of blurry mix into a hardened final image and that's how it kind of decides on what position to align it in. Now the final paper that we're going to talk about is coming out of Google's DeepMind and it's actually not about attention is all you need. They went back to the RNNs, the recurrent neural networks, for some updates. So this paper with the super sexy title of Griffin, the mixing gated linear recurrence with local attention for efficient language models. is all about jazzing up those old school RNNs for language models. So in this paper, these authors are proposing two new models. They're calling one Hawk, the other Griffin. Now, if you remember, RNNs were this hot thing before the intention mechanism was on that was all just about learning context recurrently. So like a sentence, just step by step by step, kind of think of it like walking up steps and whatever step you're on has more attention than the one behind it. So you're kind of always living in the moment. And the first part of this system, Hawk, gets smarter about how it kind of retains a longer back history, like how many steps that you've walked up. And then they throw on this other mechanism called Hawk. And Hawk is doing what we all have seen incredible results from with the attention is all you need paper and chat GPT and all the large language models that we do today. And that is bring attention to that long context window that the RNN is working with. Chat GPT that has these tokens, but it's also got some sort of sense of like diminishing returns as it goes further back down the staircase. And it works pretty well. According to the paper, Griffin matches the performance that comes out of some of the Llama 2 models that Meta has released. And it did that despite being trained on much fewer tokens. So it did that with less resources. In theory, the advantage to a system like this would be efficiency because it has that sort of shorter context window for 
what's new. But yeah, they haven't done this truly at scale. Griffin has been scaled up to 14 billion parameters, which is big, but it's not like 70 billion or Grok is at, I think, 320 billion or probably in the trillions for like GPT-4. But they have managed to make RNNs cool again. So I did want to say thank you guys for supporting my last video. It didn't quite get to the 1000 view mark. However, we got really close. So 972 is like almost to a thousand and it generated, you know, $4. We got a decent amount of watch time compared to my other videos. So once again, we're like above the average and that means the world to me, like maybe the algorithm will kind of take notice if we just keep pushing the envelope like that. So I was fairly happy with the performance and I definitely take some blame. This title, the Shirky principle was not really that popular with you guys. Like I got a 5.4% click-through rate so you know that like nerdy looking robot and that like shirky principle might have not been I mean it's funny like I knew you not everybody knows what the shirky principle is but also I just gotta just know that and like not put it in the title so I'm gonna try a little more like punchy zazzy kind of thing in the next thumbnail video combo title but yeah you guys are all coming in from the browse feature so you must be seeing it on the for you page so let me know in the comments below if that's how you found this video and i'll leave you with what is one of the most succinct reasons why i completely want to devote my time and life to artificial intelligence and it's because i think it that quote that like it is man's potentially last invention the invention that invents better than humans and it was succinctly explained by yaval harari and i thought i would just share this with you so we'll see you guys in the next video like the decision to drop the bomb on hiroshima was not made by the atom bomb it was made by president truman and similarly it can uh, every previous technology in history it could only replicate our ideas like radio or the printing press it could make copies and disseminate the music or the poems or the novels that some human wrote now we have a technology that can create completely new ideas and it can do it at a scale far beyond what humans are capable of this is the end of human history not the end of history the end of human dominated history. History will continue with somebody else in control. In five years, there'll be a technology that can make decisions independently and that can create new ideas independently. This is the first time in history we confronted something like this. Every previous technology in history, from a stone knife to nuclear bombs, it could not make decisions, like the decision to drop the bomb on Hiroshima was not made by the atom bomb was made by President Truman. And similarly, it can, uh, every previous technology in history, it could only replicate our ideas. Like radio or the printing press, it could make copies and disseminate the music or the poems or the novels that some human wrote. Now we have a technology that can create completely new ideas. If you're human or robot, hit that like button. Thanks for watching.